that music only means one thing. It's time for the map. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Bernstein, and you are listening and watching the Mental Health and Addiction Podcast. And this is mm, <laughs> this is a weekly show about having an open and honest discussions around mental health and addiction, which is so important that's currently affecting one of five Americans, although that number might be going up soon enough, right? Um, and joining us, as always, is our friend, Willie Drinkwater. Willie, who are you? Who am I? What am I doing here? Existential questions. This early in the morning? Come on. You know what I'm I know, saying? know, right? Right. Uh, I'm, uh, I've, I've been in the uh, field of mental health and addiction for over 30 years now, 32 years. Uh, I'm a person in long-term recovery myself from addiction and co-occurring. Uh, I'm an educator for UMass Boston. I teach in the Addiction Counseling Education Program, uh, senior faculty at Cambridge College, and uh, past preceptor for Harvard Medical School first-year residents. Look at you, and and you are a former former comedy writer for the Rock, for the Rock of Boston, WBCN. For the Rock of Boston, WBCN. No more, no more. But no, yes. that was a, but but humor is a big part of what I do. What are you, what you do? So all right, um, Chris Long, one of our uh, mainstays here. She is on um, the Cannonball Run, um, driving the Florida. So we don't know if we're going to hear from Chris, but. Uh, the show must go on. Um, as for me, my background has been in media, in TV and radio for over 25 years. I created a show with former hockey player, hockey great Kevin Stevens called Crossjack, which we did a show. Willie was a part of it for uh, about two years where we talked about uh, addiction and interviewed all kinds of guests. So um, I kind of stumbled in this, but I'm happy to be here. So um, we're going to meet our special guest in a few her name is, she's in the box, she's in the lower left, or my lower left, her name is <laughs> Stephanie Marcusano, she's from the Harris Project, but before, before, we, before we start our conversation with her, our, uh, our executive producer, the great Mike Weber, put up something that I think could be very apropos for what's going on right now in the world, so Mike, if you want to put it up there for us, okay, um, so Mike read this blog, which I thought... Uh, would be very helpful for for people right now and it's uh i did not know this but november is a month for gratitude and uh you know it says it's been a rough year for everyone uh whether you you know between the global pandemic social isolation economic slowdown and civil unrest there's been a lot of factors that have been affecting us so you know, as the stats I just read in the beginning that one in five people suffer with mental illness, um, and they're saying right now, according to the CDC, 40% of people have experienced a mental health or behavioral condition related to the coronavirus and epidemic. Remember that? Um, one in four uh, have experienced symptoms of depression, four times higher than previous years. One in 10 had considered suicide at some point the last 30 days and an increase of 100% from previous years. And 13.3% of Americans have begun or increased substance use to cope with stress related to the epidemic. So obviously people are on edge right now and the blog goes on to say, it's no longer possible to wait for better days that we must take back control. So obviously if you are sus suffering with anxiety and depression, um, it may not be everything you need, but, um, but I like this because he's given us some benefits of gratitude, which I'll kind of read for everybody real quick. Um, gratitude reduces stress. It makes us more resilient. It helps us feel more positive emotions. It unshackles us from toxic emotions It improves our self-esteem, decreases the symptoms of depression, helps us sleep better, better interpersonal relationships, enhances optimism and lower blood pressure, stop smoking or lose weight. So there's a lot of benefits to it, making, I guess, making a list of the things you're grateful for and uh, because there's a lot. So uh, Willie, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I'm I'm overwhelmed at times, you know, j just from the number of referrals. I'm getting like three to five referrals a week for my practice that I can't even touch. So I'm trying to trying to f refer to co to colleagues, but my colleagues are full now too. So I mean, it, it, it's a crisis that's going on. There's a shortage of therapists at this point. Do you see it getting worse? 
Um, yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I mean, the closer we got to the election, the more, the more, the more concern that I had for a lot of people. I started to started to have clients go inpatient psych and to detoxes the closer that we got right up to yesterday. So, you know, it was it increasing over the last month, week by week. It, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the predictions that it's going to continue to go up and it, you know, and hopefully, uh, as they say, this too shall pass. So, um, you know, the uh, mic, uh, if you could show where people can find it, the blog. There you go. I always wanted to do that. Mike, can you please cue that? Up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, becoming, becoming minimalist. Huh? Okay. Yep. Becoming minimalist. So um, look it up. Good piece. And uh, so let's get on to our special guest. Yes. Who is a friend of ours. You could be a friend of mine, right? Are you? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Um, Stephanie Marcusano, she is the president of the Harris Project, which is the only national nonprofit focused on prevention and treatment of co-occurring disorders in teens and young adults. She has been a passionate voice and is a passionate voice, bringing co-occurring co disorders from out of the shadows and into the light. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Absolutely. Now, you and Willie work closely together, so I'm going to turn it over to Willie and we can uh, get this thing started. So, Willie? Well, we did. I mean, the, the, the first time that we spoke on the phone was years ago, and it was like, you know, I didn't know Stephanie, and she called me up, and there was this LinkedIn uh, connection for the phone call, and I, I don't know how long we spoke on the phone for, for maybe a couple hours even you know, and stuff, but, uh, I could feel your passion right then. You wanted to do something and you, you boomed, you definitely boomed. So, so tell, tell us about the Harris project and kind of how, uh, what the organization is and a little bit about your background. Sure. So, um, this was a boom that I was not anticipating or expecting. Um, my 19 year old son actually died by accidental overdose in 2013 and he had struggled with an anxiety disorder and ADHD and ultimately turned to substances to self-medicate. And when he kind of left the mental health side of things and went into the first inpatient rehabilitation program, they said he had co-occurring disorders and they treated it. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm a former PTA president and school board member, like I knew everything about, you know, programs and things to do. Harris had been in treatment for his mental health disorders throughout his life. And so they said that they treated it. And when within a year and a half, he ended up dead, having been in four inpatient programs and two outpatient programs, I thought this co-occurring disorders thing, I need to figure it out. I want to unpack it. And I launched the Harris Project at his funeral. So by focusing on prevention, we create those opportunities for young people to kind of recognize themselves in the narrative learn how to kind of navigate to resources earlier and, and make different decisions about substances. And then on the treatment side, you know, I met Willie because I thought that we were going to need to create the treatment model. You know, they all failed. So what were they doing wrong? And through my connection with Willie, he then ultimately connected me to Dr. Ken Minkoff from Zia Partners, who's the international systems change expert. So um, I literally built the opportunity and the capacity to work where I live in Westchester County, New York, um, and then across our whole region to actually do systems transformation, do more prevention work. So that's kind of, you know, where I ended up. Again, not the journey I ever anticipated on being on, but I really saw the need. How did, how did, um, I think I remember you telling me that, you know, people don't, address the co-occurring disorders when it comes to um, our children, right? Yeah, As, so, uh, it, yeah. it might be getting better since I last spoke to you, but explain how the, how it works. You both can explain what that means because now it's becoming a buzzword of sorts. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is it? I know trauma, grief, abandonment, Willie, you, you say a lot, but how does it work in, in, in someone, it, you know? Yeah, so practically speaking, um, so I present even via Zoom, like we're in this, you know, weird COVID-19 world, I will present in a Zoom with two to 400 high school or college students and what do they need to know? 
So when you have things like anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolar disorder, oppositional defiance disorder, you're not feeling comfortable in your own skin, right? So the vast majority of those who develop co-occurring disorders are part of that 22% of teens who have a mental health disorder with severe impact. They then begin this process of self-medicating, probably thinking they were just experimenting like everybody else, but not really recognizing what that's going to do to their brain, to the developing brain, to the addictive part of their brain. And then they kind of ends up in this spiral. So if they don't understand the relationship, how do we expect them to do things differently? Then you kind of have layered in the trauma piece. So, you know, young people, you know, ACEs and resilience and all of that is a big conversation piece. So where does trauma fit into the conversation? Then you've got the whole other chunk of young people where I always say like, in these big assemblies or in these big virtual spaces, you know, so you don't have a mental health disorder. So you're thinking, well, she's not talking about me. I, I'm never going to get this co-occurring disorders thing. But then you have the young people who truly impact their brain just by smoking marijuana, drinking, or if they're an athlete and they get prescribed opioids, not recognizing that they can become addicted or dependent on those opioids in five days or less and their body numbs out and they're, they're depressed because they're not practicing with their team. So what we want to do is create these opportunities to empower our young people to understand it. Then when you actually are in that space where you've got both going on and we're working to navigate them to resources, so the mental health providers will say, well, I can't treat that kid until he stops using substances. I can't prescribe anything. And then on the substance use side, they'll say, well, we need to really stabilize you and, and get you off the drugs and detox you. And then we can treat your mental health. And what we've learned and what Dr. Minkoff will tell you is that people are complex. And if you don't address the whole person at the same right. time, the likelihood that they'll sustain recovery is greatly reduced. Right. I can share my own personal experience with it because um, I have ADD and uh, anxiety and depression. And as a young person, I needed to quiet my mind, right? I still need to quiet my mind. But what I learned is is that um, it's the chicken or the egg, right? And it's like, well, if I, you know, well, you get on this hamster wheel, it's, it, wheel, it's like, and luckily I got off out of it, but it was... Um, you drink to calm your mind to make yourself feel better but then the alcohol being a depressant will yeah yeah i yeah if i can interject it's yeah like, of course do i drink because i'm depressed or depressed because i drink and the answer is yes right right yeah. yes and then as you go then your life starts to become really chaotic like me personally i didn't open my mail for three years I didn't. I, I didn't. I just, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I avoided it. And then, you know, for me, I thought, oh, well, if I work and make a lot of money, then it doesn't matter what I'm doing. But this all really started from, from childhood. And um, luckily, I went to a doctor who, a, a long time ago, who actually helped me understand this. And he didn't put a name on it, but that, that's what happened. And luckily, I was able to get out of it by treating my depression and anxiety. So it's interesting that you keep saying I got lucky because what I often say to young people when I present is you shouldn't have to get lucky to yeah. make out the other side. The treatment model should be designed to meet your needs. You right. shouldn't have to like fortunately navigate to that one person at an agency or in a clinic who can kind of do this work, which right. is why, um, so on the one hand, we have the prevention side of things. And so we branded it. So we've got CODA, Co-Occurring Disorders Awareness. You see like the logo I'm wearing, mm -hmm. two stars. It's from a poem that my son wrote to my daughter. First line, my little star ever glowing. Like we had a ribbon and somebody said to me like, you don't want to be another ribbon in the pile. Pick like a logo. You're going to go national. That really tells the story of co-occurring disorders. So it has the personal feeling for our family. But when you look at the two stars, you're thinking mental health and substance use. Mm. Our hashtags, Coda Connects, the power of connection, hashtag be the link, like linking to resources. So that duality is easily recognizable by our young people. Like we have homecomings, awareness games, youth summits, all about educating and empowering young people around co-occurring disorders. Mm. Then we work with Ken and we do all the systems transformation work with our hospitals, our agencies and providers. But guess what? Yeah, and Willie will know this because Willie doesn't know that much about this new piece of what we're doing, but he's going to say, of course. 
system <laughs> transformation in a vacuum is only going to get everybody so far because how do they actually do the work? Like, yeah, we're committed. Yes, we come to your meetings. Yes, we want to self-assess and do a better job, but where's the treatment model? So right. during COVID, a very unexpected time, WMC Health put out a promising practices grant opportunity. And I was strongly encouraged to apply. And with one of our local providers, Family Services of Westchester, we received a grant that allows us to do more CODA work, mm -hmm. allows us to do more work with Ken Minkoff on systems transformation. Mm -hmm. But I had also found an evidence-based treatment protocol for teens and young adults with co-occurring disorders out of the University of Colorado. So nice. we put out an LOI and Dr. Paula Riggs created this program in Compass, met CBT with motivational enhancement therapy. Uh -huh. And we have 24 clinicians from six agencies in Westchester County who are not only trained, but are part of a two year pilot where they're going to be doing clinical conferencing with her and really developing a best practices model that will hopefully roll across the state. That's so awesome. um, so this is really kind of what I call like closing the circle, because now when I present to young people, we actually have young people who know what co-occurring disorders is. And now we actually have a treatment model once a week, individual therapy, where they're not part of a group and kind of learning behavior from other people, but really working on their individual mental health needs, their trauma and their particular substance use needs. So to me, like, you know, a really unexpected opportunity during this time, but, you know, we'll take what we can get. How did you, how did you discover this? I guess it's a two part, I guess. Uh, tell us about a little bit more about Harris, if you would, the, the type of kid he was and how did you arrive here? Like, how did, how did you kind of discover this whole or not discover, but how did you learn that this was the thing that was affecting Harris? So, um, so he, I mean, his anxiety disorder was apparent from the time he was three years old and he did not, he did what a lot of young people do, but you never label them as having an anxiety disorder. He projected out. So he was not a young person that kind of shirked in the corner. He was really good looking, really funny, super athletic. It was almost like the extremes were very intense for him. So the world around him did not really give him much of the benefit of the doubt when his behaviors weren't so great. Like, how could that anxious kid be the life of the party and the class clown? So this like challenge of who he was on the inside versus the outside caused him a lot of stress and strife. So that was always a, a real challenge for us. Things would ebb and tide, things would get better, but um, he lost the opportunity to play sports because he was so anxious. So then he kind of fell into a different group of people because those coaches couldn't really support him with his struggles. I mean, they should have been able to, and that's what we work on now, you know, working right. with coaches and athletic administrators on this, but he kind of just never really navigated to the right resources for what he was going through. We're a super close family. My daughter was a senior in high school when Harris died one week away from her early decision application to go to Syracuse to be a social worker. I mean, she now has her MSW and is working with <laughs> athletes at a college as a counselor. And so, um, you know, I always say that in my tragedy, I have to be the most fortunate person because I really had a very clear vision of where I think the system went wrong from prevention all the way through to like relapse and support. And I found my way through a path to meet people like Willie, to get connected to the Department of Community Mental Health in Westchester and have a deputy commissioner at the time who had been in the field for 25 years and said, this is it. And he's now the commissioner and he's one of my closest friends. And we just, you know, he'd invite me, go to this collaborative meeting, go to this consortium. I'm going to give you five minutes and talk about what you want. And it started just building from there. You know, you can't do this alone. And I would say that um, the families and the young people, it's a light bulb going off for these young people. Like they do games and programs and things for so many different causes and co-occurring disorders impacts them and they've never heard of it. So they really feel like they're the change makers. Uh -huh. And then with our professionals, no, well, there are probably a few, but for the most part, nobody goes into the behavioral health fields to make a lot of money. You go in because you care about people. So if we could introduce the opportunity to be more successful in your work because people are doing better, that's where the engagement begins. Like, you know, even if the funding streams aren't where they need to be yet, and New York State has a lot of challenges with our two agency system, 
Mm. We have really willing and brilliant participants who advance the work on the clinical side as well and on the administrative side. And so New York State, our two agencies, the Office of Addiction Services and Supports and the Office of Mental Health, two siloed agencies. Just last Monday, I testified they are doing listening sessions on integration. And, you know, so so many people testifying about not just merging the agencies, but doing true integration of so that your intakes, your assessments. It's like the SAMHSA model. SAMHSA had a grant years ago that Connecticut picked up where they integrated their mental health and addiction services. Massachusetts, we have the same thing that New York does. We have DMH for mental health and DPH, the Department of Public Health, covers the addictions. But it's like it's like. Each of them is a little fiefdom mm-hmm. and, you know, they don't like to play in the same sandbox because of budgets and, you know, it, it just holds back treatment. And yeah, and the difference for me is I don't really get funded from anybody. Like, you know, this, this grant that we got from WMCL is, Health is the first biggest grant we've ever gotten. So I am not, you know, beholden to anybody. So when I yeah. testify, when I walk into the space, it's no holds barred. And I have to say our providers have become very, um, very clear in in the value of the work. So it's not just, you know, the mom alone, but we also had, like I had a 14 year old ninth grader who testified about the value of integrated prevention in our quota model. And so you know, there is no funding through the mental health side for prevention. It only comes down the substance use side. So how do we bring these things together to meet people's needs? I, you know, I find it really interesting. Again, going back to my own story, had I been in high school and you told me, you know, because kids know, they know that if they're have anxiety or depression or things like that. If, if you told me that, if you told me that there was a, uh, something that could kind of make sense for what is affecting me, I would listen right off the bat. Right? I mean, I, w- I don't even, it just makes sense. And that's why I do what I do. So I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a substance use counselor. I'm a mom. And everything I do is kind of rooted in Harris. Like Harris was a really smart kid. Like I, you know, this election cycle, everything going on in the world, racial injustice, social inequity. These are things that he cared so deeply about. Like I miss him so profoundly. Like I have no idea how he would have managed during this time. Like maybe it would have been good for him to kind of take that pause, be home a lot, not be out in the world. But every Everything that I do, every time I tell my story, every time I present, it's it's rooted in us. But then I give young people the facts, the information. Why are the suicide and overdose rates so high? How do you know the message about say no to drugs or mental health lets end stigma and still ends up in this pathway? What do you need to know and what can you tell other people? And when I tell you that um, I presented to a high school student athletes and club leaders last Wednesday night via Zoom, you know, as anonymous a space as you can get, the inability to touch and feel, the comments privately, I mean, it was filling pages. Isn't that I- amazing? Yeah. Because you you're speaking to them. You're not... You're not preaching to them. You're speaking to them. You're yeah, giving you're them not the talking at, talk, you're not talking at them. They're talking with them. Yeah, I mean, it's like if I go to a high school, you know, I, you know, I will, I will, I will tell them, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you not to do drugs, although I would prefer if you don't. But if you, if you're even thinking about it, then go to a, a source like arrowwid.org, read as much as you can about it, get as much information about, you know, what you're thinking about ingesting, and then you can make an informed decision. You know, I mean, if you treat them like they have a brain and intellect, well, right? It's much better. If you told me don't do something, if a parent told me, yeah. By the way, Chris is uh, trying to get in from her. Uh, yeah. Chris's big adventure. She's texting me. Let me in. Let me in. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you tell a kid not to do something, they'll do it. That's why I told my two sons I don't ever want to catch you at the library. You right. Know, so, uh, we'll so get to see Chris on the hey, road again. Chris. Hey, yeah, Chris. Her, Chris's trip across <laughs> America. <laughs> Stephanie, this is Chris Long. She works for Aware Recovery Services, where she absolutely loves her job. And um, she's muted right now. But Chris, say hello. Hi. Hi, Hi Chris. Stephanie. Hi. Hi, guys. I'm in, um, where am I? Where am I? Oh, we're in Florida. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, I don't know how warm it is right now. Oh, we got 270 miles, 78 degrees, 270 miles, 75 miles to go. 
I there you go. Um, All right. So we're we're talking to Stephanie Marcosano. She is the um, the founder of the Harris Project. So um, I don't know where you are, Chris. You yep. dropped off Delicious. again. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Stephanie. So I so, just want to say something based on like what Willie was talking about. You know that like he he directs kids to kind of read about the substances and what they might do to them. Yeah. I take it kind of one step further. I okay. say you know. I would like to just like everybody wears my bracelets. So these bracelets are handed out homecomings games. Like there are thousands of kids in high schools wearing them. And I say, you know, if you're wearing the bracelet and you're at that party and you're about to make a decision, if you stop and think about the why, like, am I doing this because I don't feel comfortable in my own skin? Am I doing this because um, I really don't even want to be here? Do I do this because I want to be more sexually promiscuous and I kind of need to kind of drop down my guard? Those right. opportunities to figure Liquid out courage. what's going on. Do I need to talk to somebody about that? And for friends, I say, you know, you have that friend who drinks to blackout. Are you taking pictures and posting it on your Snap story or on your Instagram story? Or are you saying, you know, I've noticed that I'm concerned when I see you. And then really knowing who you're going to talk to about it with them. And so it's this shifting the conversation from, uh, you know, this is so fun, let's just do it. And I didn't like create this out of the air. I put together focus groups of young people. My daughter, I said she went to Syracuse, like Syracuse was named the number one party school in the country when she was accepted. She knew she was not ever gonna open the door to substances based on her life and experiences with Harris, no drinking, no marijuana, nothing. And she would hang out in the lounge and the freshman lacrosse players all lived in her dorm. And one of them said, you know, hey, I have an uncle like you. And she said, well, what do you mean? And he said, you know, in recovery. And she's like, oh, I'm not in recovery. This is a conscious decision. Like, I just don't use substances. And, you know, as a somebody wanted to be a social worker, it was without judgment, but it created these really clear opportunities to talk about why, why young people are doing what they're doing, what it must feel like to be at an event in real time, to know that that fight was gonna happen before the first punch was thrown. And it got everybody to just be more mindful. You know, we're talking about mindfulness at the beginning with what you shared about what's going on. Like it's our generation, my generation that kind of messed this up for everybody. Go to a baseball game, you're holding a beer, you go to that party, you're holding sure. a out. Like we've lost the ability to just be who we are, live in our discomfort. And if it becomes too much for us to manage, to know that we should navigate to resources and not answer, you got lucky with that right clinician. I tell young people all the time. It was a PCP. It so was look, a I mean, look how, but look how lucky. I see the young people, mental health is not like, you know, you tear your ACL, you want to go to the best surgeon. You don't care if they've got a good bedside manner, they know what to do. Your mental health is a little different. You know, you want them to have evidence-based treatment practices, but you also need to connect. So I say, if you're going to somebody and you don't feel that connection and you don't feel like you're being helped, you need to tell somebody because you may want to switch professionals like you're a consumer. And we tend to think like mental health, like somebody gave me a name on a piece of paper. That's who I have to see. And if I don't feel better, that's my fault. It's like, no, not everybody is the right fit. So now, that's see- why I always said, say to interview, interview a prospective therapist. You know, you know, how long have you been working in the field? How many people do you work with that have what I have? I mean, well, I think the other thing is, too, is that we right. we get like scared we're going to hurt them or, you know, we're going to be embarrassed that we don't we're not connecting. We, we get afraid to be open and honest. I mean, how many times, you know, oh, I feel bad. I don't want to tell them that I don't like them or we're not connecting. So you just you just stay and you're not until you're strong enough to walk away. I mean, I think about it all the time. Like I don't like people but I'm just not a mean person. So you just stay. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I, you know, people reach out to me all the time and I created this list, like, you know, how do you vet a program? How do you vet a provider? And so I gave this woman a list and her daughter was in an Ivy League school staying in a hotel because she had been kicked off campus because of her substance use, but it always struggled with her mental health. And I sent the mom the questions because they were looking for a provider near the college that she was at. And I had never necessarily thought that the parent was going to share the list with the kid. And the mom called me and said, so the weirdest thing happened. She said, you know, I've been doing this treatment thing wrong my whole life. And the mom was like, what are you talking about? She said, well, 
I, you know, I started to learn what they wanted to hear. And so when we talk about how I was doing, I became sort of a character in a play where I was sharing with the, with the counselor what they wanted to know, but that wasn't helping me at all. I'm going to do this completely differently. And when they approached the school and they, you know, and she, they let her back in and she did really, really well because she approached the whole selection process and the engagement and treatment in a completely different way. How do you, are there metrics or outcomes that you try to like you you said you got a grant right so what, what uh, based on the grant you know are there certain metrics or outcomes that you they want to see to justify so, so with this grant actually no it's a promising practice innovation grant so they really wanted me to be able to do me and really be outside the box with all of it but because we're working with Dr. Riggs and she was originally funded through a research grant through NIDA. She has a lot of the data points and the collection points. So all of our providers are putting it into their EMRs. We're gonna be collecting the data that we wanna be able to show New York State. Why? Because Encompass is slightly more expensive. It's a slightly longer session, like it's a full 50 minutes to an hour. There's um, motivational enhancements. There's unsupervised talk screens. There are things that are, you know, you need to budget for. So in order to justify the cost of the program, we want to be able to show the state agencies and Medicaid the value of the work and the outcomes that it creates. Because what are we doing? Once a, everybody knows who's in practice, once a week for 17 weeks versus a young person who might be in a residential treatment setting, might be out of school, school district might have to pay for another placement. Those are really expensive. A slightly more expensive one hour, 17 week program that really shows great results. I mean, it shows really clinically significant reductions in mental health and substance use, you know, over the, over the time and, you know, and completion rates are really high. And so this is, these are the opportunities we're looking for. I'm, I have so many questions on this, but are, are there, um, cause I, cause I can, again, apply it to my own situation. Okay. So you're a high school kid, right? You learn about this program. You mm -hmm. learn about going current disorders. You go, you move into adulthood. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you take away as, you know, like, and I'll, I'll throw it out this out to you, all of you is like how many adults would you say that are suffering with addiction? It started with co-occurring disorders. Oh my God. I mean, constantly I'm working with adults, you know, thirties, forties, and fifties. And all of a sudden we're right back to family of origin, you know, and it's, it's stuff they never talked about because they were told, you know, go to a meeting, get a sponsor, your life will be happy, joyous, and free. And right. it was like, nothing else was, was talked about. And I'm not knocking, I'm not knocking 12 because that can always be a part of someone's recovery. But if you have mental health issues, which most people will, and you're not addressing those, good luck trying to stay sober. Right. And so that, and that, you know, so on the young person side, they say that 43% of young people who are in treatment for a mental health disorder already have a co-occurring substance use disorder. I stick with the 70% number, although everybody in the field will tell you the number is much higher than 70% for people who have co-occurring disorders. And then, you know, I, I took it one step further. There's a, you know, on the prevention side, how do you demonstrate success? I mean, we're keeping kids from doing things or connecting them to the resources early, really hard to prove that it works works. But I did find a study way back from 2007 out of the University of South Florida that literally said the time between the onset of a mental health disorder and subsequent substance use is a key window of opportunity where co-occurring disorders can be prevented. And that has been my mantra is that the, the ounce you spend in prevention is worth the pound you're going to spend in the, in the treatment and the cure. And so that's really, you know, the vision. Well, I mean, I mean, that's one of the big things, too, when you when you have research coming out of Harvard that says you don't see a significant drop in the relapse rate till someone gets 100 days of continuous treatment. Yet all all we fund is 30 day uh, programs. It's like, you know, it's like, well, you know, 100 days is going to cost more. But is it really going to cost more in the long run? I mean. But you know what, but Willie, I spent a lot of money for Harris to be gone for like 90 days, 100 days, but yeah. 
because they were not addressing the as a health disorder, it was yeah. like, you know, is it, you can take that what I call a pause, even incarceration, which is obviously nobody's cure for co-occurring disorders. No. But people are like, you know, my son was in, in jail for, you know, three months and then they came out and they just it was right back as if nothing had ever happened. Or young people who go into a wilderness program or, a, you know, a residential school setting and mm -hmm. they come home and it starts again. It's because right. you don't right. address the whole person. If you don't address what drove the use. I mean, there are a percentage of people who, you know, they get an injury, an athlete, they had nothing going on, they get addicted to opioids. And if you just, you know, put them on um, medication for opioid use disorder, and a little bit of treatment, they're going to do well. But statistically, most people are in that middle of the wheelhouse where they've got a lot of things going on, you really need to spend the time to unpack it and treat it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's, you know, yeah. I, and I and I have never deviated from that path. Like, you know, people like, Co-occurring disorders is my thing. You know, it's sort of like my big fat Greek wedding and everything is Greek. <laughs> I always think that like the, the bigger umbrella, if you really look at it through a behavioral health and wellness co-occurring disorders lens, you're gonna capture people with mental health disorders, people with substance use disorders and trauma and all the stuff in between and be able to do things right. Yeah. Chris, what say you? Well, I think it's uh, it's interesting because I am with a company now, and that's what we do. We treat the whole person um, as well as the family. And you'd be surprised when you know you, you bring it all in the same room. The lights go on when it's kind of when when both teams throw all the cards down on the table and say, "Hey, it's A B C for your loved one," but guess what? It's EFG for you guys and together until you address everything, nothing's going to change. And, um, you know, the co-occurring, I mean, just wait until, you know, post COVID like that's, I don't, I don't even want to, I don't even want to walk in that storm, but, um, it's programs like what you're doing and programs like aware we're going to be bogged down with these co-occurring because, the anxiety and depression and, and fear that everybody's living in right now are driving, you know, alcohol use and drug use up yeah. and suicide. And I will say one thing about the encompassing, which is a little bit different on the family piece. So Dr. Riggs believes that, you know, you're kind of born into the environment that you live in. And if you've got family members that want to learn, she doesn't layer on more treatment for the young person. She, you know, she recommends sort of the family piece that goes alongside for two or three sessions, but she really works with the young person on the things that trigger them, the things that cause them to escalate from zero to 120, you know, in like, you know, a rapid period of time, because the belief is that they're always going to be in situations where there are stressors, where there are challenges, where it's a boss or a teacher. And so her belief is that really focusing on the young person and her programs for 12 year olds through 28 plus. And we're actually looking at ways to kind of expand it even beyond that, because the basic model is applicable for, you know, any age really. Oh. No, I was going to say I was 30. I was 30. Right. Because, you know, the guy's brain doesn't men's brains don't, you know, ever, uh, ever. But <laughs> I guess it's like 28, 29. You know, you start to really like, you know, some people mature, mature later. And I, um, I had gotten to a place where it's like, I can't continue in the way I'm doing this but the only way i got there was because of the doctor who helped me treat the things that were going on with me and that then i was able <clears throat> to start putting together but i was older right so so had i gone on my path who knows where i would have been right right so i got goal is, is to kind of like, you know, really give the information early. Like I keep saying, what would Harris have needed to know? Like what, what would have made a difference for him? A, that so many other young people were struggling with mental health challenges that he wasn't alone. Identification. He, yeah. Not everybody kind of, you know, becomes like shirking in the corner and is in a, unable to socialize. Like there, there are some people out there in the world who project forward and that that's okay. And it seems a little scary, but we're not afraid of you. We can deal with it. Mm. And then finally, the fact that navigating to substances, it's literally like you're allergic to them. It is something that you should never do because of the, the relationship between your brain 
pain, your mental health and the substance use is never going to be a good fit for you. So you may watch other people experiment and try and regulate and change and shift. But for you, it's going to be this all or nothing kind of thing. And it's never going to work. And really understanding that on a, on a very profound and deep level, like this is part of who I am and being able to talk about it. Right. And being so self-aware. Now I have a question for you. So now, you know, you, you talk to schools. We've been doing a show on it for like three years, right? I've talked to so many different moms who have experienced, um, or parents who have lost a child or, um, you know, have had, you know, and have gone out and start speaking to schools and, um, you know, different messages, personal stories, what have you. When you go out, how would you compare yourself? I, I'm throwing a curveball at you, but yeah. how would you compare your message to a lot of the other messages that are out there? How, well, you know, what is your, I guess. What's my hook? Yeah, your value proposition. How do you, how do you convey this? Yeah, so I actually, one of my first slides in my presentation is the fact that, you know, as a former PTA president and school board member, I used to bring the programs in and we thought we were doing such a great job with our young people. And so I know the mental health programs are about like, rah, rah, let's end stigma. And to them, I say, you know, please don't waste your time ending stigma the adults in the world feel like they need to do something. What I'd like you to do is just start talking about how you're feeling every single day. When it comes to the substance use programming, it's literally like scare tactics. If you use drugs, they will kill you. An hour and a half on slides of the brain. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. I tell them, you've seen one slide of the brain. You've seen them all. You've got chemicals in your brain. You introduce substances. Your brain isn't fully developed till you're 25. That's what goes on. I tell them a lot of school districts pay for famous people to come in. They share their story. They talk about how they lost their career and look what they're doing now. And you know what happens? The kids go, they look at their Instagrams, they see the sneakers, the cars, the fancy house, and they think, well, it was bad, but it wasn't really that bad because they seem to be doing okay. Right. And you have the parents like me. And I always say, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I do not begrudge a parent that comes in holds their child's picture and tells the story and says, don't do that to your family. And, you know, the young people may empathize with that parent, but if they don't see themselves in the story, it's, I call all of that stuff kind of those one and dones. What we've done is we've created an opportunity for them to learn about Harris, to learn about the facts and information, to learn how to be empowered decision makers, how to be part of the CODA movement and really, you know, project this opportunity forward and then how to navigate to resources if they're concerned about themselves or a friend. We've gotten funded to create social emotional learning tools. We took our CODA weeks that we celebrate in April. Like when Michael, the commissioner, when he's like, why do we celebrate CODA weeks in April? And I was like, well, don't you remember the original reason? You start a nonprofit for something nobody's ever heard of. I wanted to celebrate on Harris's birthday. My daughter was in college and I thought if this hits, I'm always going to be busy. And so Coda Weeks so the first two weeks of April, his birthday is April 8th. And then beyond that, how do you kind of really build like the social emotional piece, the larger umbrella, and you get buy-in, you get buy-in from the teachers union, you get buy-in from our board of cooperative education services. Everybody just is like, of course, like, why wouldn't we want to intervene when kids are just at like tier one and bubbling up to tier two? Like, why are we always acting in crisis? And so if you can avoid the crisis, think how many years you capture for a young person. Typically, it takes them so long to get help. Typically, they don't go for a mental health checkup. They go when they're in crisis, when, when somebody says something terrible is going on. So we really move to make this beyond like the moment in time with 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 real concrete curriculum mm -hmm. now is this available to other to other parents yes. are you looking to recreate more of you more stephanie's yes. like how, how do you how are you planning to expand this so we scale, we're scaling it in New York really through the mid -hut. So we have 42 school districts in Westchester County. All Westchester school districts are involved in CODA. Believe it or not, some of those clinicians in Encompass are in site-based clinics that will be in some of the high schools that are doing CODA as well. So now you've got this seamless point of entry like, oh, 
They talk about CODA. I have co-occurring disorders. There's somebody in my school who treats it. I can get navigated to resources. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, nice. across the Mid-Hudson region, we're funded now to expand. So we're doing more um, programming and building actually like more of a like kit that can go out so you can turnkey it. Our CODA like tools, like for CODA weeks, we have, you know, two weeks worth of activities and announcements and things for our awareness games. We have, you know, the logos, the brands, we have like our two star logo that's on me. These are helmet decals, stick decals. So kids wear them on their cleats for soccer games. And all of the announcements are about co-occurring disorders and co-occurring disorders awareness. No, this is like, I was also a Girl Scout troop leader. None of these was complicated or expensive to, to make. Uh -huh. And so the ability to kind of turnkey and shift it out is really, really simple. So anybody who wants it, you know, email me, Stephanie at the Harris Project .org. You know, I'm an open book. I share, you know, this is not like so proprietary. Like you want That's the awesome. our logo, take it and run with it, baby. Like this is what it's all about. So um, what do you have coming up as a nonprofit, as a 501c3? <clears throat> So, um, so yeah. literally, um, we are in the middle of our Encompass clinical consultations. We just had our second, we have, we're broken into two cohorts. The second cohort met this morning. And so all of that work is happening. They're beginning to enroll young people into the programs. On the school side, I am doing many, many, many presentations on co-occurring disorders, our CODA conversations, really empowering young people, even in this COVID-19 hybrid learning virtual world about what they can be doing. Um, um, CODA games are happening because in New York, there are, you know, games, you have fewer people in the stands, but they make sure that the other team is knowing what's going on and what they're doing on the systems transformation side. All of our seven counties in our regions are doing deep dive work with Ken Minkoff. You know, Westchester, we have our co-occurring system of care meeting tomorrow. I co-chair that. Ken will be in. Oh, actually, it's on third. Yeah, today's Wednesday. The election threw me off. Tomorrow's Thursday. We're meeting with Ken. He'll be in for an hour, really doing um, concrete mapping and planning next steps with our providers. So this is an ongoing work in progress. We also I want to give a special shout out. We yeah. also have a really great relationship with um, a group of very special moms from um, Your Mom Cares, and that's um, Adam Levine from Maroon 5, it's Patsy Noah, um, Sharon Feldstein, uh, who's Beanie Feldstein and Jonah Hill's mom, and they've been very supportive in giving us some grants to actually, you know, be able to do our work in the schools, because they're very interested in young people and mental health and wellness. So um, it just keeps going. I mean, you know, we created, so our, um, I'm gonna grab one. Probably shouldn't get up doing a podcast, but here I am. That's okay. People like have made what, lunch. Our what's important is social emotional learning tool. So this is something that like lets you map out your, you know, what's important to you. What are your struggles? What are your challenges? You know, what, what makes a good day good? We actually created this now so that you can facilitate it online. So the cloud is a text box. You can type right in. I actually did it this summer with my brother's keeper, which is an Obama foundation program. I did it with elementary school students. That's awesome. And, and so, you know, the ability to kind of find ways to protect our young people and give them a voice when they really don't know how to say how they're feeling is really, you know, those important steps. And then obviously also working now with New York State. I'm on a few New York State committees. And as those two agencies are looking to integrate you know, mm -hmm. we've really made very concrete recommendations about a blue ribbon panel to look at not just the things that I focus on, but also on workforce development. How do we credential our social workers? What could they be learning when they're in school? What should CEU credits look like? Yeah. So, and, you know, and how do you look at the financial piece as well? You know, so I'm also working with our third party payers, to, you know, to figure out the value of the work and how to kind of justify it. So you don't sleep. So you don't, you don't Ever sleep. ready bunny. Ever so, ready bunny. Um, do you have anything on the fundraising side? Any virtual events? Yes. Or anything? Oh, this is so perfect. So here we go. <clears throat> um, I presented through one of our state centers has a youth advisory council. And, you know, in COVID, our walk with Pace University is on pause till the, till the spring. But um, DECA, which is an, a national organization of marketing and entrepreneurship students the vice president of finance from New York State, this young man who was a rising senior was on, it was part of this youth advisory council meeting that was a Zoom. And he emailed me before I even stopped speaking and said, can we talk because we pick a statewide philanthropy. You know, I think we wanna go with what you do. Like, this is so amazing. And so New York State DECA has chosen the Harris Project and they're actually launching 
uh, like a GoFundMe charity thing right now. And so that's going to be on our Facebook page. It's going to be on our website. And that's a really great way to donate because you're donating to young people who are funding our programming because as marketing and entrepreneurship students, they don't see this as just another charity to pick. Like they're filming videos now. They're going to be doing PSAs. They're really looking to take the skills that they're learning as part of this organization and be able to roll it out for a cause that most people have never heard of. So it's nice. a really great opportunity. Tremendous. And where can people learn more about that? So they can go to our Facebook page, which is um, the Harris Project COD is our Facebook page. And we'll be posting that probably tomorrow. They're just putting the final touches on it. It'll be on our website at theharrisproject.org. Nice. Um, we're on Instagram at the Harris Project COD. And we're on Twitter at the Harris Pro. Wow. And uh, I guess my last question for you is um, other states are other states adopting Willie, Chris? I mean, do you think this would be something that um, is the state of Massachusetts doing anything similar to this? Uh, no. <laughs> Point blank. No, not no. that I've discovered. Not that I've yeah. discovered. Absolutely not. not. I mean, the closest thing yeah. we, 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 we have really to something co-occurring would, would be, be, you know, would, would be DBSA, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, that based out of Chicago. McLean's has, you know, the meeting on Wednesday nights. Everything is virtual now at this point, point because of the COVID. But I mean, that's that's the only real thing that addresses uh, co-occurring, you know, as, as far as the communities. And that's a community support, you know. So. so this would actually be a great program for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. The one concern that I have is is we need more cross training among the disciplines. You know, I mean, when you have, you know, some, some someone could go to BC undergraduate graduate in sociology and they're only offered one course at both levels on addiction, mm -hmm. it, you know, and those are electives, you know, and then you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm with the addiction counseling education program for UMass, but addiction counselor certification, my course co-occurring is an elective. It's right. not part of the curriculum. It's, it's just an add on, you know, and one, you know, when, when the students are in it, though, they're going, God, we, we, we really need this information. It's like, yes, you do. Yeah. And a lot of the colleges that I work with also believe that my daughter, when she wrote her testimony for the, the integration of the agencies, she mm -hmm. said, you know, I would really love to work on that workforce development credentialing piece. Mm -hmm. But um, but Andy, to your point, and I know you're so interested in sports. The other place that I got to dabble during this whole COVID time was two athletic directors from Westchester County approached me. They're on the board of the National Alliance of the National Athletic Administrator, National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. They wanted to do a curriculum on mental health and wellness and the student athlete. And they asked me to be part of the, um, the authoring the curriculum and presenting. And so, you know, I kind of went over everything through my youth mental health first aid lens as a mm -hmm. mom. Yeah. And then I, I infused co-occurring disorders throughout the curriculum. And so I mean, when we did, we've done two pilots now, every state in the union is represented, you know, there's like a hundred people and I've done those, you know, what's important to me tools virtually with them and what's important to us on team building. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is really going to help us take this national, particularly through athletics. Well, whatever I, as I was saying, whatever I can do to help you with any of the stuff that I'm doing, I would love, love to chat with you because, um, you know, athletics is such a different breed anyway, because, you know, they have a, a, you know, whether it's injuries, whether it's, you know, um, you know, I get the hurt and stress pressure, um, change in a coach, change in the team philosophy, um, change in the schematics. I mean, there's, there, I work with student athletes a lot about the high school and college level and they're, they're like, you know, we, we have to do all of this programming on, you know, drunk driving, sexual harassment, all of these things that are yeah. mandated. And they're like, the root cause of so much of this is things like co-occurring disorders, our mental yeah. health, our self-medication, our, you know, inability to talk about how we're really doing because people are like, you know, hold us up on this pedestal and it's really hard to live up to that. Well, so working, working with athletes, one of the, <clears throat> I was talking to somebody the other day who works in sports and I said, and we were talking, he said, oh yeah, I went out drinking with them. Uh, one of the players, I said, you can never drink as much as athletes can drink. I'm telling you right now <laughs> that they are rock stars. The older, you know, the professionals, the rock stars, they have money, they have the time. You know, you know what I mean? Like they're able to 
Um, no, but they're to, not, but you know, you say they have the money, they have time, but then you look at somebody like Johnny Manziel and you watch his career implode because, you know, they picked up on the substance. It, right. It's not a good but thing. But nobody ever focused on the anger. Josh Gordon, Josh, the- Josh Gordon would be somebody who, who played for the Patriots and he had an addiction. He has an addiction problem and he's a great football player, but it might not be the right job for him. But it might be the right job for him if he was able to manage his mental health and the substance use. You look at Lamar Odom. I mean, he was on that show talking about his depression, about loss and grief, and then, you know, turn to substances to self-medicate. And I think, again, what you don't know is going to kill you. And so if we can provide those opportunities to give the information, to educate. To the connect- leagues would love it. The the NA, the NHL. um you know, all these leagues, you know, because they have those young, you know, young players, they do consortiums, right? When the players start mm-hmm. playing professionally, um, you know, colleges, like you said. So um, I think it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm very these are all golden opportunities. And again, not expensive opportunities, really concrete opportunities and not one and done. Like, you know, what are we going to do with this next? You know, when I, I mean, New Rochelle High School, I've worked with them. I've won awards with their Coda Club. They're student athletes. I presented to their football team right before week two in preparation for their homecoming week six. They heard the message, heard the story, put the decals on right into that next game. Love My it. husband and I went with them to the carrier zone when they won the state championship with their rallying cry around our two-star logo. Like it was on the helmets. It was represented. They knew what it meant. And I think that those are the kind of messages that they keep with them. And they think about those moments in time where maybe they need help. It's the power of the message. Yeah. Um, so give your website again. I can't thank you enough for coming on. Yeah, it's great to have you on. No, uh, I it was like a long, you know, long night last night. And I guess no. Okay. So we're the, the Harris Project dot org. Um, you can reach me anywhere, anytime. Stephanie at the Harris Project dot org. I respond to all emails myself. You know, it's not a staff. It's me. We pay no salaries. It's all, you know, volunteers and me. And so um, I look forward to hearing from anybody who's interested. Awesome. And <laughs> Willie and Chris, any closing thoughts? Any questions? Yeah, I think yes. we, we need a second show with her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's tremendous. She's oh, I appreciate that. She's yeah, tremendous. thank you, Stephanie. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. So that's our show for the week. Thank you to yeah. Stephanie Marcusano from the Harris Project. Willie Drinkwater. Chris Long. Who knows where you are? I don't even Where even... in the world? Yeah, you're walking around the woods <laughs> I somewhere. Even, I don't even Florida. know. No, where I'm is... I'm walking my dog. Oh, oh, there oh we go. Okay. so we're getting really up close and personal about Chris's okay. life. That's we it. see your full laundry, <laughs> lunch. You know, hey, I haven't That's made my blue. I haven't made the bologna sandwiches. Okay? All right. Anyway, okay. uh, right? Like <laughs> vacation, yeah. like the movie vacation. Anyway, yeah. That's our show for the week. Check us out on Facebook at Face the, the Map, map. Twenty Twenty, and of course, thanks to Mike Weber back at Mission Control at Foxborough Cable Access Television. And that's our show for the week. And we will catch you next time on The Map. The Map. Have a Thanks, great guys. week, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.